Welcome everybody to the Healing Art of Being You podcast. We are so excited to have you here today. And we have one of my favorite people in the entire world, Dr. Steph Duffy, who is an amazing orthopedic PT in Columbus, Ohio, and amongst a lot of other things. Um, Steph, do you mind giving people a little intro into your background and kind of what you do? Sure. Thank you guys for having me on the show. I'm really excited to be here. Um, But yeah, I'm a physical therapist and a mom here in Columbus. So I started my practice, Empower Physio and Wellness, in 2019. And have it has grown and evolved and changed a lot over the past couple years, um, as has the world, and with our growing family and things like that. Um, and I just really enjoy like being around people and interacting with people and helping them feel feel their best and live their best and kind of break down those barriers of what they thought was possible. Nice. So there's a lot of there's a lot of people that work in orthopedic setting. I think that's where a lot of people like to go and work for PT. What what made you decide that like working inside the system was not necessarily going to work for you? What made you decide that like doing it your own way? What does your own way look like, and why did you decide that that was kind of the direction you wanted to take? Yeah, so it was kind of twofold. Like I remember being in PT school and thinking that I wanted to work for a private practice because even in school I realized that the traditional like corporate insurance model like nobody wins in that situation. And for my own sake, I didn't want to be burned out and um, in a career that I was loving just from in school. But I also knew that it wasn't the best for the patient either and that they needed more and they needed me to be able to show up and give them more. Um, So that was kind of the clinical side of it. But then um, once I got out into the working world, you know, I loved my first job. It was great. It was in like a big healthcare company. I learned a lot. There were wonderful people. But then I realized like the second part of it, why I wanted to start my practice is I wanted control over my time and my life. And I just hated the thought of somebody else being in control of my time. It was like this storm cloud Mm -hmm. looming over my head. And with like no end in sight. I mean, I was like a year into my career and I was like, well, this is, this is no way to live my life. And <laughs> you're like, I just sold my soul. Yeah. So yeah. Incredible. Even, even if they're like good people and I'm having right. a good time, like this is not okay with me. Yeah. You're like year one and no. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, I, I knew down the road, um, yeah, I wanted to get married and have kids and I was like, well, if I want to be at one of my kids things on a Wednesday afternoon, I don't want to have to request off six weeks in advance mm-hmm. for something that like I may not even know about at that mm-hmm. time. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was kind of in that time of my life. I met a great friend who was also a physical therapist and he was like, Hey, you need to take this course. It's all about like starting your own PT practice. And it's one of those things I haven't thought less about in my life, which is very out of character for me. I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. So I got up at like 6am for like early bird (laughs) registration and I registered for this course and I was like, oh, it's really not that hard to start your own practice. Like the business and the sales and the marketing stuff was a big barrier to me of why I didn't want to own my own thing. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of had this awakening of like, okay, it's really not that hard. Mm -hmm. And so that started the journey of, okay, well, I'm going to start my own practice. And then it was like another year or two of trying to figure out how do I want that to look? What is it? And it was a really tough time because there's a lot of comparison going on and just like being surrounded by this group of people who were well established in their careers and knew exactly what they wanted to do and I just felt very lost and so it took a lot of soul searching to figure out what it is I wanted to do figured that out and then my husband and I moved to Columbus and it was just kind of like this very clean start to like you know quit that job move to a new city and just start fresh Mm -hmm. and yeah, that's how I practice with Lauren. Nice. What kind do you feel like, because you mentioned like, I was telling myself a lot of stories. I had a lot of comparisons, things like that. Did you, were you able to kind of like sort through that all on your own? Did you work with anybody to do that? How did that look for you to kind of move past that and actually like move into the bravery of like taking that step to be like, nope, this is my practice and this is what we're going to do? Yeah, honestly, I don't remember the whole process, mm-hmm. but having had support now, mm-hmm. um, like through business coaching and like life coaching and stuff like that, I wish I'd had it at the time because mm-hmm. it would have been a much more streamlined process. But I think it was like a lot of talking with friends, a lot of soul searching, listening to podcasts, um, and just kind of figuring out what all is out there and what are my mm-hmm. options. Mm-hmm. And then I know when I decided like, like I wanted to work with mom runners, that was like my first ideal patient population. And then it just felt right and it clicked. And then once that clicked, then a lot of other things could fall into place. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned that this was 
an endeavor that you started pretty immediately when you moved to Columbus. Did you have a lot of feelings about the fact that you were starting a new practice in a new place that you didn't already have a community like set up and ready to go? Like, I feel like that's a a unique hurdle for Mm -hmm. an entrepreneur. So how was that for you? Yeah. And I've talked with people about this and everyone's always so, so surprised, but I was honestly really excited. Like I love that sense of adventure and kind of starting over new. Like when I went to college, I didn't know anybody there and it was like the most exciting thing in the world. (laughs) That's beautiful. And so, yeah, this was really exciting to me too. Um, I mean, I'd gone to physical therapy school at Ohio state, so I knew a couple people and like my husband was from here. So it didn't feel totally like a fish out of water, Okay, but yeah, at that time, like I had a ton of time, like not as much money because I wasn't working. So I just like got out and networked and met a bunch of people. And I honestly had so much fun doing it because it was like this adventure of like a new thing, like this is mine. And um, there weren't really expectations, That's I think. So and powerful. so I could just do what I wanted to do. That's so powerful. That's Why not that like, so I, I really struggled at the beginning of my business, like meeting people. Not that I didn't like know where to find people or how to meet people it was just that like desire to talk to a new human it was Mm -hmm. just like it stressed me out it like wasn't my jam and I remember you and I chatting for the first time and it was so easy it was so like seamless you were so like delightful to talk to and stuff and I remember asking you like how do you do this like how in the world do you just like go and just like talk to people and not come off sounding salesy not come off sounding like hey use my services and the thing that you said to me was it was just the thing that clicked in my head that I was just like oh my gosh and that's what I took with me into every meeting and what you had told me was first of all I really enjoy meeting new people like I really do like that but also I'm really comfortable in my own practice I know that I'm good I'm actually interviewing the other person to see if they, I can use them to help my people when there is an avenue that I can't help them so I'm not trying to sell myself to anybody I trust that people are going to show up to me because that's I'm the right person for them I'm actually looking at the other person to say are they a good person for me for my team and I was like holy cannoli that is like brilliant my that was so and wise of me I don't remember saying that no it was just like, it was just like a casual because it was just like part of who you were you know it was like yeah I'm like I'm good yeah. with what I what I do and I just want to know that like I'm not going to like, I'm not going to waste my patient's time sending them to somebody who doesn't align with me. I want to make sure that I understand it, like I have a good understanding of what other people are doing so that when I find that there's like a gap in the care that I'm able to give my patients, I know exactly who I want to send them to to fill that gap, you know? And it was that, that advice I think was one of the most powerful pieces of advice I took moving forward in my practice because that's how I go into meeting like every single person now. And it is just like, it helps me focus and like gear my efforts towards fostering relationships with people that I truly align with and that I, you know, um, I know that I know their style aligns with my style. And I know that I love my patients. My patients love me. So if I love another practitioner, they're probably going to love that other practitioner as well. And so it's just like really helped build this really beautiful supportive network between all of us that all kind of work with each other to help people get better. And it was that piece of advice that I was just like, oh my gosh, yes, just like I am good at what I do. I should trust that I'm good at what I do. And I I don't need to sell myself to anybody because the right people will show up when they're supposed to show up. And I'm really just looking to see who do I want to add to my team that can help people get better. So I appreciate that advice. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> you were starting the story. I was like, oh gosh, what did I say? You didn't even ask me what I said. I was like, that was a mic drop of wisdom for sure. It for was. sure. Because, I mean, yeah. let's, let's call a spade a spade. The first time that I met you was at a networking event. Uh-huh. We'll be honest, that was the first. At Marcy's, right? Yeah. yeah. That was the first, like, yeah. professional networking event that I had been to in my entrepreneurial journey. And I very much was like, Allison, mm-hmm. Allison, hold my hand. I can't mm-hmm. speak to anybody. I don't know what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Hi. <laughs> so the approach of you're like, no, this is exciting for me. It's a, mm-hmm. it was a, a new journey. Like that's so incredible and so inspiring. Mm-hmm. Like truly, and I can tell it your your vibe, like your energy. You can you can feel it. She's mm-hmm. very warm and open. It's, yeah, it's about mm-hmm. that connection. It's not mm-hmm. about the behind the scenes stuff, like yeah. the sale. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. I love it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Welcome. It's been good. So when we talk about, you know, like all these stories and things like that, because like I have a lot of stories, they're going to think I'm salesy or they're going to, you know, a lot in my beginning career, like I'm not going to be able to get people in the door. What if nobody ever wants to come and see me? Like all that kind of stuff. And I had to work 
obviously through a lot of those stories. Did you have any big stories when you first started or do you find that you have recurring stories as you like kind of are running your practice or if not within your practice, within your personal life or within your life as a mom or as a spouse or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely been a lot of stories that that came up over the whole journey. So it's been like almost four years now. And in the beginning, I mean, there was definitely a lot of excitement. And I think the stories came up more once we started growing our family and we had our first kid and a lot of them surrounded me putting pressure on myself. Like now like I can reflect and look back on it. Like mm-hmm. it was nobody else's fault, but like my own inner voices and just kind of like, I've always been that very like type A personality, like high achiever. And because of that, I can also be my own worst enemy mm-hmm. with it. And so a lot of work on like separating my own identity and my own self-worth self-worth for my practice because I've always felt like, you know, like this is like a mission from God mm-hmm. and like this is why I'm on the planet. And so while that was good and served me for a while, it then got really muddy if things like weren't going well. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, well, this is my mission and I'm failing. And it really like sent me on a very big tailspin mm-hmm. downwards. Um, and so, yeah, I've worked with several coaches, like business coaches and life coaches over the past couple of years that have been really helpful in helping me realize my own blind spots. Cause when you're in the thick of that, like, you don't know what's going on. You just know everything sucks and you don't like the way that you're feeling. Um, but then having somebody else be like, Hey, have you thought about thinking it this way about, mm-hmm. or about a situation this way? Mm-hmm. Or do you realize like, this is what you're doing? Mm-hmm. And over time, like, yeah, you repeat the same mistakes over and over. And then you kind of get to a point where you're just like, I'm done with this. And I'm done with beating myself up and I'm done with feeling crappy and it's not serving me. It's not serving my people. It's not serving my family. And uh, that was like the moment I made a decision of like, I'm, I'm just done doing this. I love and, that. Yeah. And so that was probably the, one of the biggest obstacles that I had, yeah. had to get through. And it's been very liberating and like things will kind of come up and it's cool at this point now, like something will happen, a situation will happen where I know in the past that would have triggered me to start feeling really bad and get really negative. And I'm like, Oh, like, I don't really feel all that bad anymore. And, like, I'm recognizing that this is happening, mm-hmm. but I'm not having that same emotional reaction that I used to. Mm-hmm. And so it's just cool to see those little things that progress, you know, over, like, weeks, months, and years of working on it. Yeah. It is crazy. Chelsea and I were talking about this earlier. It's like it does tend to be the same story that comes up, which is sneakier and sneakier mm-hmm. versions of that snor- story, where it's like it's not yes. so obvious that it's my – you know, my lack of self-love or my lack of worthiness or my need to control or whatever it is that tends to be your recurring theme. It's not always as obvious the further you get down the journey. It's a little bit sneakier. Mm -hmm. But then when you kind of get down to it, you're like, oh, this is another way that that's showing up for me. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's, let's, well, let's use those same tools to get past it again. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And it can be so infuriating too, because when you feel it, you're in it, like you can feel that you're off, but you almost don't have the awareness that that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. Right. Like you're like, what is wrong with me? Mm-hmm. But the answer is not there mm-hmm. until you kind of move through it a little bit. And then you're like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, thank you. Mm-hmm. Got it. Pattern has shown its face and here we are. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. No, you're, you're spot on. And that's why like having people in your circle who, you know, either coaches or friends that can help, help you recognize mm-hmm. those things are so helpful. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So have you found, because I know that we've talked about this a couple of times, and I've talked about this with other people who have kind of been down this journey of, like, working with coaches or counselors or whoever, just being self-reflective and just kind of, like, looking at how their life is and just choosing to kind of heal some parts of their bodies and heal some parts of their souls and minds and move forward into a more enlightened life and a more fulfilling life. Do you find that your network of friends is as big as it used to be or did it tend to be a little bit smaller than it used to be as you've continued to grow? Yeah, I think it changes. Mm -hmm. Um, And definitely a lot of the people that I've met through networking and Mm -hmm. just like in business have become really good friends like you are. And I think it's because we're working on a lot of the same things and Mm -hmm. have this desire to better ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, And also like just in life and having a family, I feel like my social circle has like shrunk but gotten closer so like you have um stronger bonds maybe with Mm -hmm. less people um and it's really it's very fulfilling Mm -hmm. and I mean 
I appreciate everybody that's in my life. Mm-hmm. Did you ever go through any of that process of like mourning mm-hmm. the loss of people that you're like, wow, we just like don't really align anymore? Or was it kind of like, you know what? I'm okay that we don't align anymore. Like I'll let them go their way. I'm going to go my way. I'm fine with this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I mean, especially like, you know, friends I may not talk to as much anymore. Like, yes, it can be sad. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I don't know, this may sound mean, but I don't feel empty. Yeah. Um, and I think I find other people and like my own thoughts and beliefs mm-hmm. that kind of fill those gaps. And it's mm-hmm. something like if I saw those people again, like there would be no animosity. Like right. there would be nothing negative. Um but I think you go into the awareness of, like, that's a lot of toxic energy. Like, mm-hmm. I'm not going to take that on. Yeah. 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 How do you move into, of like, a, like, having to be around other people that you know, like, maybe it's a family member or it's a family friend, and you know you're going to have to be around them for whatever this event is to, like, not get pulled into that toxicity? Um, I think that there's, like, an element of not caring. Um <laughs> Like, yeah, my life coach, Marcy, like, she gave me an analogy of, like, you're, like, Teflon, and if people's words are coming at you that, like, you don't align with, like, just imagine it's, like, Teflon and not, like, Velcro, and it just slides off of you. Mm-hmm. So, like, there's a couple people that I know just, like, to complain or whatever, and I'm around them, just, like, okay, I mean, like, you listen to get the gist of the story, but... I'm not taking on their distress. Yeah. And I've also just been okay with being more blunt of, like, do you, do you realize this is what's happening? Or, mm-hmm. like, you're letting this person take advantage of you, mm-hmm. whatever. And But then not letting it go mm-hmm. and not taking responsibility for whether that person, like, listens to me or mm-hmm. takes what I say to heart. But I kind of said my piece and I'm okay with it. And Yeah. Yeah. And then just, you know, move on to the next situation. I like that. I think it's, like, I think it's so hard, especially when you've been... Like, you've been on, like, part of your, like, personal growth journey. And, like, like you said, like, my relationships are fewer, but they're much more fulfilling. I have, I still have crap I have to deal with, but I do it with so much more grace and so much more ease now. And, like, and you think about where you were two years, five years, ten years ago, being in grad school, things like that, where you're just like, oh, my gosh, like, all the things that used to make me so stressed out, used to make me so upset about things, and now how you're able, you're, how you're able to kind of, like, move past that or just kind of process it easier and then you look at people that are important to you and they don't have those same skills. And it's so hard to just like not want to be like, you don't have to live like this, you know? Yes. <laughs> what do you do in those scenarios? <laughs> that that happens hard. like all the time. And yeah, it can be really frustrating because like you sort of say, there's a better, there's a better life a for better you. Life. And you, I see like, it you, for you. You don't shake them yes. and like, yeah. ah! <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Um, and that's another thing, like, I worked on a lot with life coaching. Like, you can't force somebody to change mm-hmm. or you can't – you can just can't force anybody to do anything, really. Mm-hmm. And um, so, like, the best advice she had given me was, like, you just show up with love to that person mm-hmm. and you meet them where they're at. So if someone's, like, really stuck in, like, anxiety or is really, like, down on themselves or whatever, like, kind of meet them where they're at with love and mm-hmm. – Maybe just make some suggestions. So if someone's, like, really anxious about something coming in the future and be like, I totally get that. Like, mm-hmm. this is new or this could be scary. But, like, you know, like, you're capable mm-hmm. and um, you can go into this situation and just kind of, like, give them, like, comfort and support in a way that feels safe for them, mm-hmm. um, which takes a lot of, like, breathing and, like, self-control on your own because you get to a point where, like, sometimes you do just want to, like, shake the other person or, you know, <laughs> be like, hey, wake up. Yeah. Um, and if I find myself getting to that point or if the conversation is not really getting anywhere, like, I'll just I'll just leave the conversation. Be like, you know what? We, we need to circle back around to this. Like, the other person's getting frustrated. I'm getting frustrated. It's like, we're we going to be done. done. We're going to be done. We're done with this now. Yeah. Yes. I was just talking to um, a mutual friend of ours the other day about this, and she was going through a similar struggle. And I have definitely been through this struggle before where it's just like, you just you know how good their life can be if they would just choose to see it. Because, yes. like, when we get down to it, whenever we, as we've done all the work that we've done, we, we understand, and those who have done the personal growth, they understand that, like, if you choose to see something, you will see it, you mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. So when you see people who are just living in the crap, and we can look back at our own lives where we were like, I don't know why I'm upset right now, but everything is terrible. It's like, well, because we are choosing to see that everything is terrible. Exactly. And so you just want to be like, 
please just choose to see the good thing. Please choose to see how good it could be. And it's so mm-hmm. hard. And what I kind of realized was, like, I need to allow the, like, the things that I say to be, like, like a, like a social media post. Like, you just put it out there and you can just scroll past it. You do not have to mm-hmm. take what I'm giving you. And I don't have to own whether or not you take what I'm giving yep. you. You can just scroll mm-hmm. through it and not pay attention if that's not for you. And that's fine. And I can put it out there and anybody else who's around and wants to listen to it, they can go ahead and hang out on my page a little bit longer. And that's fine. But, like, I don't need to own you paying attention to the things that I'm trying to say to help you. And that is something that I've been working on recently. But it is a hard one, especially with people who are close to you. And you're like, I just want you to be as happy as you can be. I know you can be so happy. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think as physical therapists, we fall into that maybe more easily because mm-hmm. we're such helpers. Mm-hmm. And we're used to, like, in a professional or clinical setting, people come to us because they want to be helped. Mm-hmm. But the people in our life who are just there, they don't necessarily want to be helped, but we are still in helping mode and mm-hmm. want to help them. And then you fall into like the overcaring, overgiving, which is extremely draining. Mm-hmm. Yes. A lot yeah. of that effort unreceived and mm-hmm. resentment mm-hmm. and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find that the work that you have done personally has translated at all into your parenting style and how you raise your son yeah absolutely yeah absolutely you know just trying to be more patient like that's always been something that I've really had to work with um but also knowing like kids before the age of seven like that's where like their subconscious and like their like deep-rooted thoughts and beliefs are really formed Mm -hmm. and so I really try and watch what I say and how I act especially when it comes to disciplining and I'm by no means perfect and mess up and like yelling happens sometimes but just trying to set that example of, you know, instead of, you know, if my son did something like not good, be like, be like, you are so bad for doing that. Like, you know, just be like, was that a good decision or was that a bad decision mm-hmm. to make? Mm-hmm. And just kind of like really start instilling like those thought processes, like even even from a young age. I mean, mm-hmm. some of it might be over his head, but um, just starting that and yeah, just passing on what I've learned and how I've changed my thoughts. And trying to instill that Mm -hmm. in my kid. Do you feel like anybody in your close circle, you know, who hasn't necessarily done the same work that you have done, has seen the work that you have put in, in like how you interact with the world and has changed how they interact as a result of that at all? I don't know. Probably. But I think a lot of it probably goes like beyond my awareness too. Yeah. I think we have more of an influence than what we consciously realize. Yeah. Well, you certainly had an influence on me. <laughs> totally changed. Yeah, and I, and I, and I, had no, like, you know, I had no idea. That was yeah. just like, what did <laughs> I say? To me, oh, so. no. You're just over here, like, living an amazing life, and she's people like, around you are just, like, rippling <laughs> off in, like, amazing ways. <laughs> yeah. And she's like, what? She's like, oh, okay. <laughs> the water's completely still. I don't care about it. It's great. Oh, that's funny. What about your patients when it comes to working with your patients and being an orthopedic physical therapist? You know, to me, coming from the non-PT world, Mm -hmm. to me that means that, like, really you focus on enabling others to have movement or to, to have safer movement or feel more comfortable with movement in their facility, in their own body. And so how has that shown up for you when you're working with clients who maybe aren't as open to the way that you go about your practice or to the ideas and to the energy that you bring with your work? Yeah, so I will say I think I just attract a lot of people who are open to that, but there's absolutely been situations where, you know, there might be some, you know, self-limiting beliefs or closed-mindedness. And so when that happens, like we just have the conversation. I feel like half, half the time I end up being like, a shrink versus Uh a physical therapist and just have that conversation and just like ask them questions to get them thinking like, well, do you think this could get any better? Or like, where are your thoughts at? And even just educating people. Cause a lot of people think like, Oh, well I'm just getting older. And so everything's going to break down. And probably one of my biggest frustrations, like pet peeves or people like, Oh, once you hit 30, it's all downhill from there. And it's like, well, that's a horrible mindset to go into life (laughs) with. Um, and so I think it's just having those conversations and again, just like planning ideas in people's brains of like, like you're really never too far gone. Like yeah, something, something could always improve and 
maybe we need to address some other areas besides like just straight up physical stuff before uh-huh. the physical stuff gets better. That's amazing. Um, so yeah, we, we have a lot of really cool and deep conversations and there's a lot of tears that happen and I always encourage crying because it's emotional processing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we, we talk about so many things and address so many uh-huh. things within the realm and like still the goal of helping somebody move yeah, better. Absolutely. I love yeah. the thing that you said the most that, that stood out the most to me was the, now I'm going to lose it. Michael Scott. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Words are hard. <laughs> the belief. Yes. You said you, you're, you ask questions to see like where, where their belief is at. So mm-hmm. something that I heard on a podcast a while ago that really stood out to me was that the, the definition of possibility actually lies in the belief. So if you don't believe something is possible, then it's not going to be possible for you. So you bringing that into the healing journey, really being able to like narrow down and identify like, wait, hold on a second. Do you actually have a belief that this will never heal? Mm-hmm. Because if that's the case, then we're fighting an uphill battle. We're never going to lose or win. Right. Right. Yeah, that's 100%. amazing. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. I love it. That's, that has to be so impactful for your clients. I'm sure. Do you find when your patients do have those kind of like aha moments of like, oh, I was kind of like holding on to this as like this was part of me? Because that's kind of what I notice on my side of PT. And I would guess that you probably see this as well is people taking ownership of the thing that's wrong with them is that as part of them. Right. Like, well, I have arthritis or I have prolapse or I have whatever the case Mm -hmm. is. Right. And it's like, um, you know, they like they own this thing as like part of their being. And it's like, hmm. I mean, like, it's a thing that's happening in your body, but it's not, like, who you are, you know? Like, we don't actually, like, we don't have to live the rest of our life with that. It can be a thing that was part of your life for a period, but not forever. When you have patients who are able to finally get that aha moment of, like, oh, I can put this down. I don't have to own this anymore. Do you find that their progress tends to be a lot more rapid after that? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, same here. Yeah, it's like, because they start to believe that Mm -hmm. it's possible, and then they start to see evidence of it being mm-hmm. possible yeah and then they're like, like oh actually i am better than i was last week or three weeks ago or whatever instead mm-hmm. of like oh i want to be able to run a half marathon without any prolapse symptoms but i also can't like just do my housework without prolapse symptoms right so mm-hmm. it's like if i'm not running a, mar- a half marathon without a prolapse then therefore I always have prolapse and I'm, I'm not as I'm not any better than I was. And I was like, well, yeah, but you ran three miles without prolapse and that's better than not being able to do housework, mm-hmm. you know, without the yeah. symptoms. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's kind of what I find is people kind of want to hold on to that thing being part of them. And then there's almost this fear of letting it go because if they do let it go, then like, who are they, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So. Yeah, it's a huge identity thing. And um, have you gotten into any of um, Dr. Joe Dispenza's work? Yes. Sally has been sending me some uh-huh. stuff. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Obsessed. Yeah. 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 So he's like one of my favorites. I love just like soaking up everything that uh-huh. he teaches, but he talks a lot about this of people, especially who have had chronic conditions or yeah. chronic pain or been t- they've been told you're just going to have to live with this or there's no cure. And yeah, they accept it as part of their being and they like mold their life around a diagnosis or a perceived diagnosis and it becomes really toxic but also perpetuating Mm -hmm. and um yeah and they kind of get stuck in this loop and I've seen some people who you know I can identify that maybe work together for a little bit and then part ways and I I can just tell like they're not ready to give up that Mm -hmm. identity yet Mm -hmm. I would agree that's what I would say is the the biggest issue when somebody comes to work with me, the the ma- the biggest malalignment between our two philosophies is like when people come to me and they think I'm going to fix them, mm-hmm. and I'm like, I'm not here to fix you. I'm here to help facilitate you fixing yourself. But exactly. also, we're not really fixing anything because nothing's really broken. But we're really more like I'm here to help you facilitate your own personal healing. And if I have somebody who comes in and they are looking for a fixer. Me suggesting to them that they are in control of the symptoms that they're experiencing and that they can get themselves better with my help is is actually like threatening to their nervous system. Yes. It's attacking to them. Mm-hmm. And so it's like it come it, you know, they receive it very much on the offensive and they or on the offensive and they don't like it and it's it's not a good alignment because they're not ready for that yet. So I just try to remind mm-hmm. myself, you're that first drip of knowledge. 
you know, Mm -hmm. they might circle back in six months, five years, a decade or two, whenever, Mm -hmm. but eventually if they're going to come out of this, they'll figure it out. But it's hard. It's hard when you have somebody who's, or people, especially with chronic illnesses who have kind of been Mm -hmm. shown that they have to rely on other people to fix this Mm -hmm. with medications and surgery. That's the Mm -hmm. evidence that they have received. And then to be told that, like, no, you actually have way more autonomy over your body than what you think. And I would love to be able to help show you that and Mm -hmm. to help you see that. Um, It's like, well, you're going against years and years and years of evidence that I don't have autonomy over my body. So, Mm. Right. And so you're coming in and challenging that thought and Mm -hmm. that's, is a lack of safety or mm-hmm, security yeah. for them. Mm-hmm. Like you said, it's very threatening to the nervous system. Yeah. yeah. How do you thing. navigate that? Do you just allow them to kind of like move on to a practitioner that just more aligns with them? Or do you try to help them problem solve that and like work through it? I mean, I always try and help people problem solve as much as I can. Mm-hmm. And I think this is like the art of what we do. And it's navigating how you communicate that with someone because mm-hmm. some people you can have to tread more lightly and like, drip little breadcrumbs of this where you know I would be like yes like I'm I'm here to support you like let's fix Mm -hmm. this and then you know maybe as we're like um working on them like doing a manual technique or something like just kind of chit chat about um about things or about how you know thoughts affect what they're feeling and stuff like that and so you kind of like sneak in the back door a little bit Mm -hmm. um and some people need that um I usually find that just being very blunt and forward is maybe not the way that people are most receptive to that information. Yeah. Um, And you usually, I mean, people need to hear it a lot of times before it actually sinks in. And I mean, that's for everybody, like myself included. Mm -hmm. And so just like to be that like supportive, comforting voice for someone, that's always what I I go for. Um, Because I know if then if someone leaves my doors and walks somewhere else, they're probably going to get more of what they've been hearing all along and it's not going to serve them. Yeah. 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 That's a big one is just kind of recognizing that like the majority of what is out there in the healthcare system is almost it's like God complex of the practitioner fixing you. You come Mm -hmm. and you ask for help and they fix you kind of thing. And it's just it's taken away a lot of the autonomy of people. And, yeah, once they leave the likelihood of them finding another person who's going to be able to just kind of help pick up where you left off and kind of keep moving them in the right direction, even if they have a different style or technique or something not quite as likely exactly yeah and there's honestly just a lot of toxicity in the medical model Mm -hmm. right now and just some of the things that clients will come and say that they've been told some of them are honestly horrifying what's the worst thing you've heard a patient say oh i like this gosh to think through things just things along the lines of like, well, this will never get better Mm -hmm. or like someone with a knee issue and they're like well, this is just your knee. Like, there, there's nothing else that could be going on here. Mm-hmm. Um, and just, like, probably the worst is just not feeling heard or supported. Like, people was saying, you know, so, you know, a provider came into the room and spent, like, two minutes in there, was on their computer half the time, and they couldn't ask questions. That's the one that makes me the most sad mm-hmm. because in the medical world, like, we're supposed to be there to support our mm-hmm. clients and – help them and listen to them. And I know there could be a lot of situations going on and there's a lot of pressures on providers from um, corporations and I'll Mm -hmm. leave it at that. Um, And they might not have the space to, Mm -hmm. to do that, but it still just makes me so sad because that experience is really ingrained in somebody of like, well, they might not go seek out help because they Mm -hmm. think, well, this is just what's going to happen. Um, and that leads to people just accepting what they've been living with for a long time. And I was thinking about this when you're talking about um, people identifying with their condition. What I see maybe even more often is people just accepting that this is the best that they could ever feel. Mm-hmm. And I mean, like, well, oh, yeah. my knee is just always going to hurt or my back is just always going to hurt or this is normal, that is normal. And it's like debunking those myths for people. Mm-hmm. And then when you can help them get to feeling better and it's like, their eyes get so big and they just light up. They're like, oh my gosh, like I didn't realize how bad I felt yes. until now I feel good. And that that's like the best that's moment. That's the best feeling. That's the best oh, moment when that, when that happens. And um, you just feel like a mom to all of the people yeah. that you work oh. with. And you're like, yes, like you made it. You yes. made it through. And then once they know that there's a better possibility mm-hmm. out there, 
now they're going to hold themselves accountable to Mm -hmm. stay there because like, well, I don't want to go back to feeling as crummy as I did. I know Mm -hmm. this is possible. And they're going to, you know, hold themselves accountable Mm -hmm. and take the steps that they need to do to to keep that up. I think seeing my patients gracefully manage their first flare once they've made that connection that like, Mm -hmm. okay, my body still may hurt. Something may happen where my body does hurt again, but that doesn't mean it will always hurt like this. Yes. Like, this is okay. I don't need to, like, go back into... Do- and they, like, they don't have to go back into doomsday. They have their emergency action plan in place. They can make themselves feel better. And they do it all independently. They'll come and be like, I was flaring over the weekend. I did my stuff. It was amazing. I felt great. We went out to dinner on Tuesday night. I had no issues. And it was just like, oh, my gosh, flares are getting shorter. We're, mm-hmm. you know, we're having a lot more autonomy over this. You didn't start flaring on the weekend and then sit in that until you saw me on Thursday, you know? It's, yes. it's amazing. Um, and I do want to make a quick little side note. Um, we do talk a lot in here about kind of in the system versus out of the system. And I want to make very clear, none of us are sitting here saying that practitioners in the system are not good practitioners. Absolutely. We are saying that the system is not set up in order to support practitioners to practice the way that they would want to practice based on the parameters that they are given around their paperwork, their time that is spent with the individual. And so in the, the, back end stuff that they have to meet in order for them to keep their job basically Mm -hmm. so now there are good and bad in every field that's that's its own thing but you get that across the board Mm -hmm. um but in general if you feel like you're not being heard it's because that practitioner is not being given an environment to be allowed to hear you not mm-hmm. necessarily because they are not good at their job. So I just want to make absolutely. sure that we yeah. put that little clarification out there. This is not anti-system practitioners. No. This is anti-system <laughs> because they yes. don't set up an environment for practitioners to bring their gift of love and compassion, which is the reason all of us go into healthcare is because we want to help people. We've either had a personal experience ourselves or we have had a family member with a personal experience or a friend with a personal experience that we think – we really don't want that to happen to somebody else. We, we spend our entire lives learning information in order to be able to help people and then are put in an environment where we are not being allowed to help people the way that we know that we can. So as frustrated as you are when you leave that appointment, chances are your practitioner is also equally frustrated. The amount of times that I yeah. would be angry and throwing charts across my desk (laughs) because an insurance company denied, you know, a patient Mm -hmm. from receiving treatment or would give us four visits for a patient who was having a laundry list of symptoms. Like it was just, and then when that happens, like we can't sit and talk about the things that are truly causing the symptoms, the mindset issues. We have to spend all of our time, as much of our time trying to hit as many areas as we can in order to help as much as we can in the limited amount of time. So Little side note there, mm-hmm. circling back though. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm glad you made that disclaimer. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. All about the integrative approach here. Yes. Select like what works for you. Yes. It's not going to be the same for everybody, but we're not on board with the exclusivity mm-hmm. that often comes with. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing. The whole thing. Yeah. Okay. So, Steph, my question for you is what is like. What is your, like, favorite personal technique? When you feel like you're getting into the crap, how do you how do you personally work through that? Is that, like, are you a, let me walk in the woods or let me talk to friends or let me journal this out or I have a specific technique that I use? What do you do when you're feeling like, I don't know why I'm angry or irritated right now, but let's work through this? Yeah, I usually reach out to somebody who... I know sees my blind spots and can help me through it. Cause I'm, I mean, I'm a very highly motivated person, but like when I don't know kind of like what to focus on necessarily, then that gets frustrating for me. So like usually having a conversation with like a coach or a friend Mm -hmm. is very, very helpful because even just talking through it helps me process it. Mm -hmm. And then kind of like once I know like the issue of like, Oh, your thoughts are holding you back right now, whatever. Then I'm like, okay, well, I know what to do. Like, I'm going to go listen to some podcasts. I'm going to read my books. I'm going to journal. Mm-hmm. And also, probably even more important, there is like, I'm going to hold the space to allow myself to do those things. Mm-hmm. Um, it is really, is really helpful. So, like, just an example a couple weeks ago, I was just like 
not feeling good. Like my energy was down, like entering third trimester pregnancy, our son was having meltdowns and there was just a, a lot going on. Um, and so I was talking with my business coach about it and, you know, it was a lot, a lot of things came up about like doing like, well, I, I have to do this or that, or like this with, you know, we just moved our practice and, um, it, it was, yeah, she was like, well, well, write down, tell me everything that you wrote down that you need to do. And I was telling her everything and I was like, had this light bulb moment and I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm not on the list. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, I was literally just going to tell you like, you're, you're not on the list. And so I was like, okay, well, this is just highlighting, like, I know I'm doing the things that I need to be doing, like, from, like, a tactical standpoint, mm-hmm. but from, like, a personal and energetic standpoint, I'm not. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was helpful. And then, I, you know, I have the strategies that I know how to do to help bring myself out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, it's just, like, first, I think, having the awareness mm-hmm. and, like, really observing what's going on. And when you're in the thick of it, like, it's a skill to be able to take a step back and look at like okay objectively what is actually going on here Mm -hmm. i i really love like the thought model that that marcy teaches the whole like what is i find the hardest thing for me is to figure out what's my actual circumstance here like that's like the first it's like supposed to be like your your circumstance and then like the thought associated with the circumstance the emotion you feel what's your action to that and then what's your result and for me it's like well i know what my feeling is i feel super ragey right now like i am real angry i know that i feel that why am i angry and i can come up with all the thoughts because this is going to happen and blah, blah 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 and i have a hard time coming up with like what is the actual situation here like what is my circumstance it's like yeah, I, I, that's the one that like stumps me for so long, and then like the more that I practice that, it's so much easier now for me to be like, oh no, this is the actual circumstance. It's literally, I you know, my husband is going on a golf trip. That's the circumstance. Like, but for me, the circumstance is my husband's going on a golf trip, and then I have to do all these things and this and that and yada 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 and all this stuff, and I couldn't figure out through all the noise what the actual circumstances. So I said, that's for me, the one that like, I'm like, yeah, that's, that's my go-to now mm-hmm. when I'm like, why am I feeling so ick right now? <laughs> yeah. And then it's connecting the thoughts between like the circumstance and what yeah. you're feeling. Cause it sounds like you were having a lot of thoughts about the golf trip that like, you didn't even know it was the golf trip. Right. Right. And it's like yeah. literally what it would shed light on. It's like, Oh, actually my husband and I have set up a fantastic environment of equal responsibility Mm -hmm. and now he's gone. And I now am going to be picking up the responsibility Mm -hmm. just as he would do if you were gone. gone. Right. Right. So it's like, Oh, am I really going to sit here and be mad about the fact that we've integrated a life of equal responsibility within our house? <laughs> is that really what I'm going to get raged about? Am so I really going to be mad? I know, right? Am yeah. I really going to be mad about the fact that he is following my encouragement for him to foster male relationships and yeah. friendships? I'm really going to be mad about that. He's gone for like 48 hours, and I'm going to rage about this. I'm like, okay. 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 I see you, Allison. Yeah. I'm just telling all sorts of stories over here. <laughs> I love that though because you were able to find the truth in the story yeah. right so like the situation yes. yeah the truth in the story that's beautiful right but you know what the problem was is I was hot and sweaty yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was really oh, yeah. irritated irritated, irritated. Was, hot and irritated I was hot and irritated I was irritated, I was irritated and irritated. all yep. the stories came to the surface <laughs> because it was outside of my 74 degrees in the sun <laughs> without movement temperature regulations <laughs> Oh, my oh, Lord. Man. I think, isn't San Diego somewhere that has, like, very, like, regulated temperature? I've always heard it's, like, pretty Yeah, like, that might even. be your place. That we'll might to, be my place. Ask Rose. I yeah. know. I'll have to give her a call. Yeah, I um, I, I really don't handle being hot and sweaty. <laughs> yes, Rose. Unless I'm working out. Do you get irritated in yeah. San Diego? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a word they use there? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm i sorry, folks that folks in Ohio who love summer, I don't get you. I don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not for me. I'm not a summer person. It's Summer's easier on the coast when there's, like, breeze. a breeze. Yeah. 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 Summer here is a little bit, like, suffocating. The only breeze that we get is, like, a brief yeah. thunderstorm. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, all right. Well, I want to ha- have one last question, but before I do, Chelsea, do you have one? Um, well... No, because 
everything I write down, you channel into your own question. So. <laughs> well, you guys are so in sync with each other. I can hear you <laughs> shouting it in my brain. Exactly, earlier. my guides or your guides are like, yes, mit, mit, mit. yes. No, I heard the question. Take it away, <laughs> sister. Absolutely. Okay, so let's say that you, you know, let's say somebody's listening to this and they're like, you know what, like. Maybe I have been dealing with this pain for longer than I needed to. Or maybe I have been kind of dealing with these issues and I don't really need to anymore. Maybe I don't need to hear the story of, oh, I have arthritis and now this is what it's going to be or I'm over the age of 30 or whatever. Um, What would be something that that person could do today to either get, either work on the stories or get their body moving in a more supportive way? Yeah, I would say the first thing, and this is advice that was given to me too, is just to observe what you're actually feeling and from like a very neutral way and non-judgmental way. So, um, for example, if like you're feeling frustrated or you get really ragey or you um, just feel like you want to hit something or whatever, just like observe that. Like don't try and change it. Don't label it as good or bad. Just be like, wow, I'm feeling really ragey right now. Mm -hmm. And just recognizing what your thoughts are and what your reactions are to circumstances. Like that's the very first step. Like you just have to figure out what's going on automatically that you're not really aware of. Mm -hmm. I think that's perfect. Mm -hmm. I think that's really helpful. Absolutely. That was a hard one for me at first. And then I realized, oh, I feel ragey a lot. (laughs) Mm-hmm. And then we got a stand for a punching bag, and I felt much less ragey. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing how that works. Yeah, punching bag, slam balls, they all. Oh, yeah. yeah. They do the job. They do. They do the job. Well, I know that there was, like, a big, like, I feel like a long time ago, not a long time ago, but, like, maybe 10 years or so, people were, like, I feel like there was kind of this, like, looking down on people who used exercise to manage their mental health. It was, like, you need therapy. You know, not going for a mm-hmm. run kind of thing. Yeah. But it's, like, we really, we need both. We need both. We, we need, need both. Because, like, when you sweat, when you cry, when yeah. you work really hard, when you scream into a pillow, when you hit a punching bag, all of those mm-hmm. are releasing those stress hormones. They're getting Absolutely. that. They're mm-hmm. allowing your body to utilize it and then get it gone instead of it, like, festering within your system. Mm-hmm. Going to therapy or coaching or counseling or whatever that, whatever flow or working with your pastor, whatever flavor you like for mental health, Mm -hmm. that is helping you regulate the thoughts in your mind so that we don't get those hormonal cascades of all of these Mm -hmm. undesired emotions. So both sides of it are incredibly impactful. And when you're dealing with chronic pain, both sides are impacted by Mm -hmm. those thoughts and those that lack of mobility and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, and doing something physical like, you know, going to a boxing class or Mm -hmm. punching your punching bag or going for a run, like, it's very physiological because Mm -hmm. when we're in that, like, either angry or heightened state, like, our bodies don't know the difference between being triggered by stressors in our life that we don't really need to run from Mm -hmm. and the very primitive version of, like, a bear is chasing me Mm -hmm. and I need to run for my life. Like, that circuitry is so primitive it doesn't know the difference. And Mm -hmm. so it's going to mobilize your body to literally run from a bear so Mm -hmm. if you are being triggered and have to like sit in a meeting all day or like ride in the car with your kids while you're really fuming like your body is literally preparing you to run Mm -hmm. so if you can run do something physical then you're able to use that cortisol use Mm -hmm. the glucose and then you're going to be in just a much better state Mm -hmm. because physiologically you've done what your nervous system prepared you to do yeah do you teach that to your son do you help him like learn like safe outlets for anger and and frustration yeah 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 so I mean he's getting more independent like Mm -hmm. has more outbursts like this and so I really like don't cry I like I never say like don't cry or don't Mm -hmm. do this because like that's not healthy at Mm -hmm. all so circling back to your question from before like you know if you're feeling angry or like you're having a lot of feelings it's like you're allowed to punch a pillow Mm -hmm. you're allowed to scream in a pillow Mm -hmm. you are not allowed to scream in the car Mm -hmm. (laughs) you are not allowed to punch mommy yep but go punch something else go Mm -hmm. yell go outside and yell Mm -hmm. because those outlets are important i don't want to teach him to bottle it up or to push it down yeah that's when we do that with our kiddos too and it was you know because you practice it over and over and over again like you said people need to hear a ton of Mm -hmm. times and just like you teach your kids not to you know stick their hand in a door when it's closing or not to touch an outlet or things like that. Like we have to teach them emotional regulation on a regular basis as well. Mm -hmm. I think the most, the most beautiful moment in my family of seeing this was we were all cramped in a hotel room for a soccer tournament and the kids were fighting over the TV and who got to watch what show and yada, yada, yada. And I was on my period. So I was already feeling like garbage. And I went to the bathroom and I come out and it's just face full of, um, face full of a pillow and just screaming into this pillow 
And I'm like, what? what is going on out here? What, you guys can't figure this out? Like, I'm automatically, like, I'm annoyed, right? And it's like, oh, she just needed to scream into a pillow. And I was like, oh. So, like, nobody's paying attention to her. They're just, like, watching their show. They had already come up with an agreement of, like, they were going to watch their show for so long, and then she was going to get to watch her show for so long or whatever. And, like, everyone's like, that's cool. There's nowhere for her to go. So we're just going to let her, like, scream into a pillow really quick. And it was just, like, almost just, like, Mom, just, like, chill out. We got this. And, yeah, so she's just, like, screaming into her pillow. The boys are watching it. I'm just like, all right, cool. So I just, like, went over and I sat next to her, and I was like, do you want me to sit with you or do you want some space? And she just, like, curled up in my lap, and I was like, Okay, I guess I guess we're fine now. But this was just like this acceptance of like she has anger and rage right now because she didn't get her way and also she's a tiny little human who doesn't like is just learning how to compromise and she needed to scream into a pillow and we're all cool with that because we have nowhere else to go because we're in a tiny hotel room. I was like, cool. Yeah, that's all amazing. Right. That had to be, like, such a wonderful moment. It was mom, a though, wonderful right? moment. It was so beautiful. I was so, like, proud of them and I was like, you know what, guys? Like, Thank you so much for giving her that space to do that. Thank you so much for encouraging her to do that. I'm like, whose idea was it? Um, and I forget exactly whose it was. I think it might have even been hers to do it, but, like, they gave her her space to do it. And it was just like, it's like, okay, we're, we, I mean, who knows what's going to happen. They're all going to grow up and be their own people. She and we says might. this all the time, and I'm like, no, <laughs> you are actively seeing the fruits of your labor. You are. So, like, your kids are. You incredible. are. Just, like. <laughs> Witness that, and yes. like you taught them that. <laughs> I was very. They, they are definitely responding the way that we are educating them to respond. All mm-hmm. I am saying is, you have no idea what the evils of the future is going to bring, mm-hmm. and what the joys of the future is going to bring. And so you hope that you're preparing your children for that in the best way possible, right? Mm-hmm. So I don't know that if there were some sort of like massive war that were to break out, that like having emotionally developed children who are like, can we just talk about this for a second? Is it going to work? But maybe it will. Maybe they, it will. they would find their way through. Maybe it yeah. will. I wish I had Never the, say never. I don't know. <laughs> it's a story I'm telling. I need to work through this story. Yes. What is the circumstance? I'm fearful for my children's future. Yeah. <laughs> That's not even the circumstance. The circumstance is my, my children will grow up. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Your children are going to fearful. Your children are going to have trouble with it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. Goodness. Okay. Well, Steph, we could keep you here all day. Mm-hmm. But before we let you go, is there anything else that you want to share regarding health and wellness, mindset, anything like that? Or do you feel like we've kind of covered? I think we've covered it. Um, what I'll leave people with is just like, like fight for yourself and your dreams and like you're your own best advocate. And so if something feels off or not right or you don't like the support you're getting, then go look elsewhere Mm -hmm. and look inward and take responsibility because um, you are ultimately responsible for your own experience of life. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, So for anybody who is local to Columbus, well, first let me ask, do you work with telehealth at all? We do do telehealth. Okay. And outside the state of Ohio or just state of Ohio? Um, For wellness services, we can work outside of Ohio. Okay. So things kind of like fitness, coaching, lifestyle. Gotcha. We can do telehealth outside the state. Um, And... Yeah, but most of the time when people are local, they, they like to come into the office. But we do offer telehealth if, you know, something comes up. Or Perfect. So traveling. where can people find you if they want to learn more about working with you guys directly? Yeah, so our website, um, empowerphysioandwellness.com. Um, on Facebook and Instagram, also Empower Physio and Wellness. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we're located in Westerville for anyone who is here local and wants to come check us out. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming today. This thank you. Thanks for having me. This delightful. was so much fun. Yes, this was so much thank fun. Thank you so much. We're going to have to like schedule a lunch date for everyone to kind of hang out and keep up in touch mm-hmm. with everybody. Yes, um, I love that. <laughs> but thank you, everybody, for listening today. Uh, we hope that you learned a lot about that mind-body connection and how your thoughts can kind of dictate your patterns and how that gets integrated within your body, some safe and healthy ways to kind of express those emotions and why expressing your emotions is so beneficial with regards to the health and wellness of your physical body. Um, We hope everybody has an absolutely fantastic week and we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Bye friends. Bye friends. Bye.